This Future Construct podcast episode is supported by Applied Software. Applied Software is on a mission to transform industry by empowering their clients and championing innovation with real world expert consultants. So visit asti.com, it's A-S-T-I.com, and please let them know that we here at Future Construct and BIM Designs sent you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Future Construct podcast, special edition in partnership with Shadow Ventures and my fantastic co-host, KP Reddy. I am your other co-host, Amy Peck, and we have a great guest for us today. We have Roy Schwa Haim. I hope I got that right, who is the founder and CEO of Hathaware. Welcome, Roy. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this morning. So let's dive in. I, you know, let's hear about first of all how you came to meet KP. Uh, so I've I met KP through, uh, I guess, some of the mass emails that uh, he sent out, and right away got my attention. So I thought it was it was a good mass email. I reached out immediately. I uh, said I'd be interested, you know, to to potentially join the incubator or, or whatever other program you have in place for a company uh, like Hathaway. And, and I believe a week or two later, we got on a call and they, they were expecting, I believe KP and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they, they were expecting a pitch deck and this whole, uh, yeah, I didn't have a pitch deck. I didn't come ready with with, uh, you know, projections and numbers and all these things. Right away, I started up the call. I said, listen, I don't have a pitch deck. I don't have any pitch, but I have a product and I'll show you the product. And we dove right into the product. Uh, so, and I, I believe they, they liked it. They, they were impressed uh, with the quality of the product. Uh, uh, and, and that's how we met. And from then on, pretty much it's been, uh, I believe, half a year now, so. That's great. I mean, I think that makes sense. I mean, if the product can speak for itself, I guess let it. <laughs> it's part of the, part yeah. of the lesson. No, it's inter- what's interesting, I mean, like, um, that's what I love about like, Rory and I have this thing, we like slack with each other, like seven o'clock in the morning, like <laughs> every day, like it's this thing, you know? Um, and one of the things I always use him as a, like a benchmark to a lot of the startup founders out there, he absolutely focuses on what's most important which is not necessarily, oh, let me go to a pitch class. Let me do like, he focuses on two things, customers and building product. And there just aren't enough founders that do that. They're too worried about some BS at tech stars or whatever, right? Like, oh, I want to be in this. And and they they focus on all the wrong things. Um, And so what I love about like, Roey, like your story is just so fantastic about like, everything from your time in Israel, like, how do you think, you know, give some, give everyone a little bit of background on your time in Israel and like how that's like maybe shaped, like how you approach things. I mean, it's, it's shaped me as a person. So a little bit about myself going uh, more than a decade back. Uh, I was in the military. I was a commander, a paratrooper commander uh, in the IDF. And by far the smallest physically, uh, half the height of everyone there, uh, but did end up uh, being commander because it was just, I was focused on not giving up. I said, if, if this person can do it and this person can do it, I can do it. Uh, and I believe that mentality of if anyone can do it, there's no reason why I can't do it. Uh, and that mentality uh, really followed through and uh, kind of guided me through school, which is I studied in the, in the Technion in Israel. That's an uh, um, engineering school in Israel. I started civil engineering. I had I struggled throughout school, but I kept on telling myself, if, if this, this person sitting next to me can do it, I can do it. There's no reason why I can't do it. And but to be through, clear, though, you jumped out of planes. To be clear. <laughs> you were you trained very hard and competed to jump out of perfectly good airplanes. I'm just trying to make sure we, <laughs> we understand this. <laughs> but not only me, that's the whole thing. It's, it's the whole thing. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so I, by the way, also I went, uh, I for some reason I chose a 
probably the most difficult school in Israel to, to study engineering. You know, perfectly yeah. good schools in Tel Aviv and, and Mel Sheva. And in fact, my parents told me, don't go there. It's, it's not for you. It's not for, for people like you that, uh, you know, that at the time they, they saw me as not someone who was very, uh, I would say, I don't want to say smart, but someone that really applied, you know, a lot of their skill set to my education. Never was, not in high school, uh, not anywhere else. And that's why I actually did find the army very appealing to me at first and to stay there for a few years. But I wanted to, um, I actually it was during the army that I realized I loved real estate and construction, uh, leaving Tel Aviv, passing through Tel Aviv and the buildings at the time were just, we're just going up at an extraordinary pace. Uh, the development in Israel was really something extraordinary, like a magic show. And I realized I was very intrigued by it. And that's what I wanted to study. I left the army and right away I started school. Um, and like I said, the, the mentality of someone can do it, I can do it, really guided me through school one semester, two semesters, all the way till I finished, took me five years. And and that's when I came to the U.S., really to, to New York City, um, started working as an engineer and got into project uh, management in real estate development. Um, did uh, until within the first three years, I was already managing over $50 million in construction and in a uh, round of uh, development projects. Uh, up until today, I've managed over $85 million, And today, it's I'm still managing projects and doing a uh, a lot of projects in New York City, Philadelphia, um, really the Northeast New York metropolitan area. And Roe, you told me this great story about like, you went to your boss and said, hey, we should buy software to manage projects. And right. Your, so, boss so, said, your boss was like, no. Yeah. So, so, so this, is where, this is where it really began. And again, staying to the mentality of anyone can do it, I can do it. This is really where Hathaway started. Um, just finished a project. We were going to start a new project. It was, it was a $29 million project around there. And that was my first, uh, project that I was managing as the project manager. That was my project. And I said, okay, I'm doing, I have Excel, I have emails, RFIs going all over the place, submittals all over the place, change orders. I was like, this is crazy. Needed the software. Now I knew of Procore. Uh, I went, I had a demo with them, invited my boss. We all loved it and we said, let's do it. This is gonna be great. This is gonna take us to the next level. Everyone was ecstatic, especially me. And then they sent, they sent us an invoice, annual commitment upfront around $30,000 a year. And my boss looked at me and said, you're, staying, you're sticking to your Excel, you're sticking to your emails because we're not paying that. And that's what I did. But I also at that point in time realized that there was kind of a, Avoid in the market, you know, for, for really tools that are essentially what you need to take it from point A to point B in a project, right? Procore came with a, a lot and a lot of the other tools out there really came with so much extra tools that really inflated the price and, and made it not affordable for a mid-sized firm like ours. Uh, so I did realize that at that point in time, there was a void in that industry, a place for another company to come in and provide um, not call it a basic tool, but tool that really is what you need to build a project and to take the project from A to Z. And again, I said, if they can program it, I can program it. And then I started to learn how to program while really developing the software and late nights, really, really, really early mornings. Um, and more than three and a half years later, it's, it's here. So, <laughs> so Amy, this is what I think is really cool. So his boss says, no, most of us would just quit the job or find another product. He decides, oh no, like there, there should be something better, but it's funny. I don't know how to code. So I'm going to go spend yeah. the next year and a half <laughs> learning how to code because that seems to be the easiest path forward. Well, and again, you pointed out though, he does jump out of perfectly good aircraft. So, you know, the bar of what, you know, most people are afraid of is, is extremely high for you, Roy. I think that's, that's what it is. But I have to say that, that in everything you have said so far, I think we should make this required listening for every single startup on the planet, because so much of everything that you've, you've, you've both articulated in this short period 
are are such core elements of what makes a good entrepreneur. And so I'm I'm really pleased, but I think we should we should put some snippets out there and we should, you know, get founders listening to, you know, what it takes. And and there's there's some fearless component, but there's also a focus component, which I think, you know, to your point, KP, I think a lot of founders do miss. So we so you're here, you you've created the software. Um you know you're in the accelerator program now and and you know you did mention Procore which seems like a pretty good company to have in in your sites and look I'm I think it's not it's not really about competition it's about finding your you know pay, you know your path in the market I mean I wouldn't even say you're you're you know in your early days probably not taking away business from Pro, Procore because those companies aren't going to pay for Procore so, you know, where do you see the evolution of what you're building and then some of the opportunities for mid-sized companies um, to, to bring technology in and improve their processes? So it's a, it's a very good point that you brought up. Uh, I, I also don't necessarily, especially at this point in the stage of the startup of the company, um, I, I don't see it as I'm a competitor of Procore today, right? I'm, I'm providing a different product. Right. Hathaway is a different product um, and a very simple way to look at it. And, and I and I do bring this uh, example a lot is because especially when I when I was looking for a product and I know when a lot of other companies are looking for products, they feel like all these products are very luxurious and very uh, expensive. So I, the way I like to explain it is you can look at these existing companies out there. You know, we have an industry um with project management software and, and the project management software if you look at them at vehicles um we have a lot of ferraris we have a lot of porsches a lot of you know expensive luxurious really extraordinary products out there but not many toyotas not not many vehicles that you know i just want to go to the supermarket i just want to to take me from point a to point b i, I don't need something you know, so crazy, so out of the ordinary to take courses really to, to you know, be certified, uh, you know, software user, um, things like that. So I, I do see Hathaway fitting into the market as kind of the Toyota in the industry um, where, you know, T Toyota's got a very big market, right? It's, it's a different market than Ferrari, right? And, and essentially it doesn't conflict you can have a Ferrari and you can have a Toyota, right? There's two different purposes um, for the vehicles. You know, someone doing a six, $700 million job can use Procore, but if they have a 20 million, $30 million job, they say, I don't, I don't need to onboard uh, a project of this size on a program like Procore. We could use something like Hathaway. So it could really be, um, you know, in, integrated or, or used uh, in parallel with other products out there. No, I think that makes perfect sense, and I and I think we're we're you, you touched on another thing that I think is um you know can can often be a trap that that founders fall into, is is just too many bells and whistles and trying to make things too fancy and too feature rich, because because it's a programming challenge to do so. But that's not necessarily what your customer wants. And KP mentioned at the beginning that that you're focused on your customer. So are you talking, you know, you're, 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 you're effectively, you know, a customer yourself, right? Cause you're using the product. Um, but, but when you're talking to customers, what are some of the things that you're hearing from them that are, that are really informing, you know, how you're, how you're building out uh, Hathaway? So from about eight months ago, we really started to bring uh, onboard clients uh, to where the product is today. It is not going to say completely different, but it's very different. Uh, I communicate with uh, the clients almost on a daily basis. Um, I have an open line of communication uh, with all the clients, even the design teams, um, the architects, the engineers, the developers, not only the contractors and developers that actually hold the license to the software. I reach out to the architects. How, how, how would you like to improve it? And they always give me different uh, features than, than you know, the GC or the developer would. And, and, and really a lot of the goal here is um, to, to, to provide a product that doesn't really need 
a user doesn't really need um, any onboarding help, any help to, to really understand something intuitive, uh, really easy to use. And, and we've been able to actually see that quite recently. Um, as I recently told KP, we, we got a completely organic client, uh, zero communication, and that client's already issued more than 50 submittals, RFIs, uh, architects, engineers. There was no communication or zero help onboarding. Um, I just sent an email. Hey, sorry that you signed up. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And so thank you, great program, and continue to use it with no onboarding, which is very important because that also really doesn't exist uh, in these types of softwares and in these industries, you know, a lot of B2B products. There's a lot of onboarding and things like that. Oh, no. And the, the, the complexity just, you know, it, it, it seems insurmountable. And when you think about the, the workforce that's out of that, you know, it, just out there in the world, there's a pretty broad swath of people who have v varying degrees of, of technical chops. And so, you know, so I, I agree with you. I think, I think simpler is better. And so as you're, as you're going to market more, what are some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of scale and, and the problems that you're solving? It sounds like you're already getting, you're getting your roadmap from your customers, which of course is the only place anyone should be getting it. Um, but, but again, like, you know, you need to project yourself in, you know, two or three years from now and, and where do you see Hathaware kind of fitting into the marketplace? So it's a great question. And the way I do see it really uh, developing or what I see, how I see the product developing into in like two, three years is kind of reverse engineering of the products that are out there where, where you go and get a product off the shelf, right? Like, um, like whatever's out there, you're getting it with all the bells and whistles. You cannot remove it. You know, it's so again, going back to the vehicle example, um, the vision here is really to give you a vehicle and then not fully loaded. You could add all these other things that you would like to add, you know, kind of customize, um, you know, your integrations and things like that. I, I don't need right away tools that are integrated with everything out there. Um, uh, they're, they're heavy, they're, they're expensive. And, and essentially most people don't even use most of the products. And that's what I hear from a lot of the clients is I, I said 90% of what you use with Procore or, or whatever smart sheets is it's here. So, so, so that's, that's really, it. really, really giving some base price and, and you want more, here's integration for this, bring it in. Here's uh, all these other things. So, so that's that makes really, sense. The vision. yeah. yeah. And I think, I think um, you have to name, you know, your top tier package uh, parachute <laughs> <laughs> as just a reference to your early days, your fearless early days. <laughs> not, not a bad name. <laughs> Amy, I'm tell you, These like, early days. Sorry, Gabby, what were you going to yeah, say? I'll tell you, Amy, um, like everybody should keep, keep track of Rowie. Like when we talk about jumping out of planes and taking on an industry that just doesn't want to change you know, check back in in five years if he'll return your phone call, because he probably won't. He's going to be too busy for that. So he's he's out there crushing it. And uh, yeah, like couldn't be more proud to be associated with him. I appreciate that. I I'll always that. pick up your phone call, KP. Don't oh, worry. There you, go. there you go. I believe that. I believe that. So we're going to take a, a quick break here from our sponsors and we will be right back. This episode of the Future Construct podcast is supported by the amazing team at Applied Software. They have solutions for any modern project. Applied Software is on a mission to transform industry by empowering their clients and being the champions of innovation with their real world expert consultants. They have a comprehensive suite of solutions for AEC, MEP and manufacturing, and they have a singular focus to help you achieve higher performance. They have software, training, support, consulting, and custom development. Applied Software has you absolutely covered for all of your workflow needs. And BIM Designs is proud to be a client and partner of Applied Software. So visit ASTI.com, that is A-S-T-I.com, and please let them know that Future Construct and BIM Designs sent you. Welcome back to Future Construct with Shadow Ventures, and we are here with Roe from Hathaware. So, you know, you're talking to a lot of customers. Are there others, you know, kind of in your realm now that are besides KP 
who are really influential, who are, you know, helping, helping you as a, as a founder or, you know, helping kind of inform the product? Uh, yeah. So really aside from, from Shadow and Cape, you have been a significant help and not only in all these things have given me confidence, right. That it's a big part of it. Um, there, there is Ty from uh, Hansel Phelps who I've communicated with uh, on a weekly basis for about uh, more than a month now, um, going back really early to, to summer. But uh, he's been a lot of help. Um, and again, given me a lot of confidence to really continue and go out there and present it to larger and larger companies. Uh, and I take a lot of feedback uh, from uh, Ty and his team. And, and not only the feedback, but they've also, uh, I think not knowingly given me direction in, in, in who the actual target market is and, and where do I want to take this company? Um, and I think that's a very important part of how Ty and his team were able to help me. Now, admittedly, that was entirely a trick question. And so without further ado, KP, can you do the honors, please? Yeah, we've got, it just so happens we have Ty Wynn with Hensel Phelps with this. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Right. Welcome, Ty. Thank you. Well, uh, appreciate you having me on. Excellent. We don't see, oh, there you are. Yeah, there you are. are. <laughs> and we're off. <laughs> so I think while, while we have the, the you know, option of having, you know, uh, both of you here, um, if you'd like to tell a little bit about, you know, how you and Roe first met and, and how that relationship has evolved. And then, and then we're going to kick Roe out and, and we're going to talk more about him. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. You know, I, my favorite part about what I do is really meeting uh, fantastic people and uh, starting with KP. I think once uh, I met KP last year, it's uh, my optics have uh, grown. The network has just, um, you know, I think exploded. And one of the, um, you know, advantages was meeting people like, uh, Bro, right? It's uh, he's been fantastic to kind of get to know, and uh, the energy behind what he does um, is uh, amazing. I think a lot of technologies that I look at, there's so many, but I think a lot of it is the people behind the technologies. And uh, I think similar to what KP resonated earlier, it's uh, you know, I think his passion and his drive and his um, you know I think his desire to make a better workplace has been a, a fantastic thing to see. No, I love that. And, and, and you know, as KP mentioned, um, you are, you know, very generous with your time with founders. So I, you know, I applaud you for that because that doesn't always happen with uh, uh, large companies. No, and, you know, I think um, when I first met, first met Ro, it was very, you know, I think, oh, wow, it's another, you know, project management solution. But I think as we start to, to talk to him, understand really what was behind it, um, you know, beyond the picks and clicks, you know, it's uh, it started to resonate that uh, this is something unique here, you know, and though I think within Hensel Phelps, you know, I think we're a larger company and, you know, sometimes I feel that we've lost some of the agility because of the growth that we've had with, you know, repositioning when it comes to solutions and finding those right solutions because of, you know, of our ERPs in place and just the complexity that comes with that and securities and different clients. I think looking at uh, uh, Hathaway, it was refreshing to see that there was a product out there that was real simple in approach, right? But then really solved a lot of the problems that we all face today. Um, so I almost wish sometimes I could go back in time and, and met half aware of this product, like, you know, at our, um, you know, the, the, the timing in when we needed to find a solution like this. So, um, but uh, that's really where I, I, I got really interested in, in the half aware product and obviously roll behind it and, um, and trying to help my best to kind of figure out what is that sweet spot for half aware. And it may not be, for a, you know, a billion dollar company, but there's a lot of potential, I think, for the right fit in, um, you know, the multi-million dollar companies, right? So again, just trying to figure out what that means. Not to say that Hathaway doesn't become a billion dollar um, solution, right? But I think that's kind of where we're at today. Yeah. And not, you know, not every company has to become a billion dollar company, you know, yeah. that, that a several hundred million dollar company is a pretty nice company. We should be very yeah. happy with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For me, I think, you know, in my career path, uh, career path, it's, uh, it's been amazing. I, I think, uh, you know, like I, um, a little background on myself, I, again, academically from architecture and, 
I think, uh, unlike most people, I had my midlife crisis in my 20s, right? I had to do some soul searching. So got out of architecture, started to kind of dabble in different industries, worked in telecom for a while, um, worked for a long time for the North Face, right? Testing product and running warranty. Um, really got to love the outdoor space. And then as I was approaching my 30s, needing to kind of get grounded again with really where do I want to be when I grow up? And so, you know, pivoting to uh, from all those different uh, backgrounds, I went and got a job with Hensel Phelps as a field engineer uh, uh, in a very small project up in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, 15 years ago. And I think through the transition and in, in, um, seeing kind of technology come into the construction space, I was kind of put front and center for Hensel Phelps to kind of take on BIM, uh, what was known back then. And really to understand, you know, how we can build better. And I think leverage on technology to do so. And so with that transition, 15 years. Enabling them and, and creating efficiencies in all we do and ultimately delivering a schedule and, and call. Uh, eight plus uh, eight districts uh, uh, with two that's a southeast and then uh, as far out as uh, Oahu on the Pacific Islands. And so within that, we you know uh, catered to uh, a lot of different clients. Uh, our biggest, I think it seems like every job, uh, every district has a aviation project. We are the largest aviation clients. We're a builder. Uh, within that, we do a lot of hospitality, a lot of healthcare, a lot of critical missions. So a very diverse portfolio. And um, I think we're always willing to roll up our sleeves uh, to take on a new initiatives, kind of uh, front and center of what I'm doing today for Hensel Phelps is, again, uh, into a new role that really is going to be focusing on um, emerging technologies, helping companies like Hathaware, and, and again, trying to position Hensel Phelps uh, in the best way we can to um, meet the cadence of the needs of the job site, but then um, bring innovation into uh, the job sites uh, as well. I think, you know, you mentioned some of the unique challenges of, of you know, bringing in new software into, a, you know, a, a large company. There's, you know, a lot of legacy systems, you know, it, but, it, but again, it, you know, it, it seems very clear that Hensel Phelps, just, just by virtue of the fact, you know, that you're there with this innovation role, uh, you know, are motivated for this. So, so is, you know, part of the job, just understanding, like, how are we going to be able to bring new technology in and what systems do we need to, you know, either alter or change to be able to allow all of this new technology. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right, Amy. You know, I, I think a part of this too is really staying connected to the needs of the job sites. You know, and I think that's where I truly feel that I um, I help groups like Athaware and Roe just because, you know, they, they come up with a great product, but I think, um, you know, at Sensel Phelps, our ability to expose these products to our, our people and, you know, our owners and projects is really uh, a tremendous thing, right? I think I almost, you know, I think at, at many times I ask Roe to come to the job site, you know, hang out with me for a week at the job site, and just understand that, you know, the one functionality that you think may be trivial in development may be something that that individual at the job site hits a hundred times a day and it's not trivial, right? So getting that connection there is important. And then really to answer your question, yes, na navigating through the complexities today, uh, it could be a great point solution, but is it cost effective? Is it sustainable? You know, um, elephant in the room is, you know, is it going to get acquired in, in two months, right? So within that, as I'm positioning technology and emerging technologies, it's really looking at cost, sustainability. Can I scale it? Uh, is this something my people want to get behind? Because honestly, it's not me telling them to use this product. They've got to touch, feel it, and, and uh, feel, uh, you know, they want to invest sweat equity into making it better as well. Yeah. Ty, you know, um, funny enough, you know, this morning, Microsoft announced they're buying Activision, right? So the, the, the uh, really? six, wow. yeah, <laughs> wow. Right. The six headed yeah. monster just like, just got bigger. Right. <laughs> yeah. And what I see in like AEC technology right now reminds me of, there was a time magazine article <clears throat> with Bill Gates on the cover in the nineties with him being a cyborg. And it said, you will be assimilated. <laughs> and it was a time, a point in time where Microsoft was everything. Like we didn't even know anything other than windows. You know, there were a few of us, goofing around in Unix or whatever, or Linux, but generally speaking, corporate America was 100% Microsoft and that's where it was. <clears throat> and there was a lot of discontent, right? Like, oh my God, every time I get a new product, it's buggy. Like, you know, everybody was just always upset with Microsoft, but you, you had no choice. 
that same visceral feeling I had in the 90s, I am starting to feel with the incumbent software companies in our space. Like they're not being challenged or to your point, they get acquired and it's not like they do anything to make them better. In fact, they maybe hold them back. I mean, is that just something I'm seeing or is it just me being like, you know, me and wanting to challenge everything or, or are you seeing that too? Are you seeing that like part of what's going on is like everybody wants to meet with startups because they're just a little bit not thrilled about this incumbent software companies. KP, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, I think that is the rhythm of what I'm seeing as well. And, you know, I think it adds Hansel Phelps and again, being very cost conscious, we are a toy owned company. So I think every dollar that I do spend, it, it makes a difference for me, you know, and, and, and seeing what you're, you're, you're um, you know, communicating there is absolutely true. I think in the incumbent software groups that I work with, I think very, you know, little do they listen, uh, you know, they, I think they, they position themselves in a way that, um, you know, to K, you know, KP to your point, it's uh, our way or, you know, you don't have another solution, you know, so um, I hate that approach. I hate being back into a corner. And I think that's a lot of why I love partnering with groups like Hathaway, right, to kind of um, root for the underdog to a certain degree, but then to give the industry options, right, which for me, I think that's, the ideal state is to have options. And I think with some of these incumbent groups, um, they're steering us in a way that we are having very little uh, uh, opportunity to uh, look at options when it comes to whether it's coordination or just even offering. It's, you know, I think when, you know, the other side of a 2KP is I think it's very dangerous when I think owners are starting to be prescriptive in terms of what we should use at a job site, you know? And so that causes complexities in itself because, you know, as a group, if I'm using a certain um, solution to manage a project and also I get into a, uh, an environment where, my goodness, you know, the owner's prescribing this, we're using this, it causes redundancies, it causes double clicking, it causes inefficiencies. And I feel really bad for the trade partners, right? Because there are multiple projects. So they're not only having to see that waterfall effect from, you know, owners to GC, but then now they're having to um, work with you know, those complexities as well in their own environment. So uh, the waterfall effect, I think, is dangerous and it's, it causes a lot of inefficiencies. And, and again, what I'm seeing with the incumbents is, again, they're trying to uh, make it less and less, I think, uh, um, I think uh, uh, open to uh, sharing and, and, and crossing data across different, uh, um, you know, data sets. And, and that's the value, I think, is in the transparency of how we use data. And I think with uh, some of these approaches, it makes it hard to do so. Do you, do you think it's just us that see this? Or I mean, I mean, you have peer group. I know you're, you've been in the industry for a while and yeah. you, all you guys talk, right? Are we the outliers that are like, I don't know what they're doing? Like, or, no, not at all. It's, um, I think with every conversation I have, uh, that's always front and center. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, what is your tech stack? And, you know, how are you guys approaching this? And how are you approaching it from a, a cost standpoint? How are you looking at it for sustainability and growth? Uh, and it almost seems to me a lot, a lot of times that, you know, with some of the incumbents, you use their product well, right, which you should, right, but the reward is really this amazing escalation in cost that doesn't make it cost effective or sustainable to a certain degree, right, so, you know, it it's, uh, puts everyone in a really bad spot, and, you know, I, I understand, I think, with the incumbents, they need to make and generate profit, you know, but I think with that, they need to be partners as well, right? And, and, and really willing to work with you, not only from a development standpoint, but, but uh, also uh, something that's manageable from a, a cost uh, perspective as well. Yeah. How much are you focused on just, you know, emerging tech in general, and even some of the improvements in, in network architecture, um, you know, in, you know, 5G, you know, hybrid clouds, edge compute, like what are some of those I mean, are you sort of looking at that in sort of a, you know, a, a you know, kind of, you know, macro and micro level? No, Amy, absolutely. I think in what I support for Hensel Phelps, uh, again, the diversity, it starts as early as project development, right? Um, looking at um, technologies that help us to simulate and put packages together to, to um, chase, you know, potential investments. You know, so you're looking at, you know, from demographic data to, um, you know, like trends as early on as that. And understanding also material, uh, the supply chain as well, uh, as, as we start to head into some of these things, and uh, within that, through the the meat of construction, we're always looking for you know solutions to um, make us or give us uh, better information to turn around 
um, you know, uh, answers that we need to deliver at the job site at that, at that pace. So we're looking at robotics, we're looking at hardware, we're looking at sustainability as, um, you know, equipment as hardware as a solution versus, you know, buying it and, and then, you know, depreciating it after three years. So every little bit, we're turning over every little thing to look at, you know, how um, hardware affects us. Uh, down to um, tracking at the job sites, right? That's something that's very important to us. So we're partnering with, you know, not only hardware companies, but software companies. And then within that, you know, how we turn the jobs over at the end of the day, right? I think a lot of owners are driving towards managing their facilities in a much better way than they are today. And so we're having to partner the back end with, you know, um, you know, a, a equipment manufacturers that we can get readings off the machines that allow us, us to better manage those assets uh, all the way to work tickets. So, yeah, the full cycle of from project development through, you know, the life cycle of managing a facility and working with partners, um, you know, whether it's hardware or software and, and really at the end of the day, partnering with our owners, because we, we understand the way that we need to hand the job over. And it's, you know, it's cleaner, it's, it's, it's more digital, less of those boxes of um, paper that we typically deliver and those boxes end up in some Connex box that no one knows about. And so, you know, they don't know if their equipment is under warranty or not, right? So that whole thing for me and, and Hensel Phelps has been uh, a tremendous focus. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Ty, you think, you know, you guys, I mean, Hensel Phelps, your top ENR firm, um, someone in your role, like, how does like a smaller firm look at the pattern of what the larger firms are doing? Cause I, I talk to a lot of them, the midsize, the smaller firms are like KP, we just figured out BIM kind of like this year. And you're talking about all this other stuff that we need to be thinking about. Um, how do you, I mean, I, I feel like some of the smaller, there's like a mentoring that happens with the larger firms to the midsize and the midsize and then even your subs and all right. And I, th I think a lot of these folks, everybody's just so busy. Um, and they're, is there any advice you would give to a CEO of a construction company, like how to think about investing time, money, and more so like mindshare around innovation and this kind of stuff? No, great question, KP. And I, God, if I could do it all over again, right? Um, I think the key for me was really would be to focus on the workflow, right? I think often we are just so reactive about what we're having to solve for that particular week or day, right? And they're trying to find a solution for that. Not being strategic about really mind mapping this whole thing from beginning to end. I think as you are bringing in solutions, how does it work with your current environment? Um, is solving this problem, but then you've got this other solution that potentially does this. And so where we are today with a lot of the larger firms is we lost the ability to be agile Right. Although we, you know, we get in these contracts and then we get deployment because when we get deploy these technologies, it, there's a lot of cost behind training. Right. And getting people on board and just getting it standardized. And, and so within all that, the complexities of really, you know, for larger companies, um, you have less opportunity to really streamline your processes because of the complexities that way. So if I could do it all over again, I think, you know, I think I would have focused more on really the workflow and then any, any single component and really strategizing about within that workflow of how do I get, for instance, you know, we do a lot of virtual coordination, right? And that's where the industry is today. And it's taken some time to get there where we virtually prototype. What a great concept, right? And then everyone agrees to where they install and then we, you know, prefab and, you know, that, that whole thing just resonates and it, 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 it's a great concept. But, you know, the reality is today is a lot of times it stops there and it doesn't get into the field, right? And so in the solutions that, you know, you, you should choose is really ones that really support not only office, but feel when that transition is much cleaner. So after, let's say, for instance, after we virtually prototype and everyone's prefabbing, that same solution or that same data makes it into the field. And the field staff are using that same virtual content to understand layout, understand whether it's installed and install uh, right or, or, or wrong, right? And, and to get ahead of just the reaction, because by the time I know something's installed wrong, the reality is they're never going to rip it out because the schedule and you're just going to compound on it, right? So being more proactive up front with technologies that give you those early indicators, I think is another piece of advice I would, would in, uh, instill. Yeah, do you agree? I mean, so I, I you know, and you, I give a lot of talks and on, I keep talking to people about your CIO and your CTO are just two absolutely different functions, whether by position or thinking, and so many CEOs, especially in our industry, really don't know the difference. They're like, oh, that's the person that does our computer stuff. 
So because they do our IT network, they should also be our innovation stuff, right? And it's kind of like, mm. and I've seen the, this pattern of talent coming out of the BIM side of the world, kind of leading innovation. And my, my, my view of that is like, that's the right move. Because like you said, you started 15 years ago, you're comfortable being on a job site. You know how like, you know how the sausage is made, so to speak. Yeah. And maybe an IT manager, like they're too busy worrying about printing and emails and Zoom, like all those tactical things. Um, have you seen a shift in that? Because like the, the idea of a chief innovation officer or a CTO, it's pretty foreign to our industry. Yeah, absolutely. Especially within the um, construction space or the build space. Uh, but it's real, you know, and, and KP, you're absolutely right. I think there's areas of focus. And I think as the CIO or chief information officer, it's infrastructure, right? It's every, everything that you communicated there, KP. And it's, you know, they literally don't have the time um, to understand really, unless they grew up on the job site, to understand the why behind what we do, you know? And I think a lot of times that's important is that context, you know? And, and so you're absolutely right, I think with VDC and how it's ev um, the evolution of VDC, it started out as BIM, right? And then it just mm -hmm. uh, got to the point where it was VDC where, wow, it does more than just the virtual content or the virtual model. I think everything my group supports today, again, is from project development through owner turnover. There's many things that we support that is not even a model associated with it, right? And, you know, a lot of times they're like, why is a VDC um, resource in here? But to KP's point, it is because I almost call us, uh, for a long time, KP, we were almost considered IT light, right? Because really when a job site needed to really um, source a new solution, bring a new technology in, it wasn't really IT's place to be deploying it. Because again, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just a technology. It's really understanding the people and, and learning how to teach them and enable them to use this technology, right? And so um, to your point, that's been the evolution of VDC where a lot of my peers around the country today, they are getting into that CIO position, the CTO and, and leading the innovation charge for their companies because they not only understand technology, but they understand their people, which I think is a uh, prerequisite for anyone that needs to get in that role because they get the context of the why. Yeah. How, how has it mattered um, to your owners, to your customer, right? A lot of these tech companies like, like Roe or, or any of our other companies you've met, there's, you're the customer, right? The, the GC is the customer. And sometimes they forget, like you have a customer too, right? You have a customer called an owner or developer. And sometimes they have, for good reasons and focus, they, they have blinders on. How are you seeing like owners and developers like engaging with you on these conversations? Or are they just like, hey, build our building, build it as cheap as you can, as fast as you can. We don't want to talk. Like, it's, <laughs> or are they actually engaging? <laughs> They are honestly, um, they're getting very progressive, right, in understanding what they're getting at the end of the day in terms of digital assets, right? So they're very proactive in that. Um, and yeah, they're very intrigued. I, I sit, so I, um, I moved into Arizona in 2012, and it was to support the largest um, project uh, that we've ever had, one of the largest projects. It was for a large semiconductor group. And so within that, I, I still stay in this cadence with them nine years into meeting them, you know, in 2012, where we meet on a, a monthly basis and we talk about innovation and technology and, you know, specific to their needs. How does some of this stuff help them, you know, from everything from supply chain to, again, you know, uh, as building to how we turn over the, the building at the end of the day. So, yes, I think our clients, to answer your question, KP, are getting very engaged, very proactive. Um, I work with you know, um, you know, Microsoft not too long ago and helping them understand how to better leverage the HoloLens for construction. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, it's a funny story. One of the gentlemen that used to work for my team actually developed one of their first, um, you know, apps that allowed us to take um, technology or virtual content into the HoloLens and use it in the field to understand installation uh, design and, and, and install validation, right? So yes, these, these owners uh, more and more are, are definitely wanting to get involved in, in a better understanding of, of how technology helps the construction aspect of what they do. Is it, is it factoring into any of these like net zero sustainability goals? Like are they, is it, is it factoring into some of the things that are just so important to owners these days, like large owners? Um, is it factoring into that? Yes. You know, and I think it's, um, you know, for a long time, it was very fashionable. I think there was a huge movement with lead, 
you know, and I think today it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's gone away, but it's kind of, you know, at a point where it needs to be re-energized, right? And, and I think that's the thing that I am seeing that's coming is that I think as a GC, we will be more, uh, we need to get more proactive about starting to capture some of those metrics when it comes to carbon footprints, it comes to construction waste, things like that, that I think will be more prevalent uh, coming up fairly quickly. Um, we just don't have, I think, as um, solutions in the industry, many out there that, um, you know, that, that serves that purpose. I, we are working with one, thanks to KP and his incubator program, that I think is, um, you know, heading in the right direction. And, and I'm fully supporting it like Athelware uh, to see if we can get there and get in front of it. But so, yeah, that's that's coming, KP, where I think that's going to become more prevalent and um, kind of start to get prioritized higher. Yeah, I have all the best founders, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> no, so far, so good. I I'm pretty happy. No further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, simulation and, and you know, and you've talked a lot about 3D assets. It's, it's, you know, ironic that in this industry, it is a 3D industry that has basically kind of crammed all the visualization into 2D for decades and are now yeah. starting to recognize that those 3D assets, you know, have touch points throughout the process. You know, what, how, what are, what do you think are some of the drivers that are going to allow large companies to take that step back, look at end to end, you know, from design all the way through to the kind of building lifecycle management, those 3D assets are incredibly valuable through the process. Yes. But to your point, who has time? <laughs> so, yeah. so what are going to be some of the drivers you think that that will start to you know you know bring this into the fold as as the standard? Yeah, I'm going to answer this question and it may touch on an area of controversy, which I think KP is not afraid of. Uh, <laughs> so forever, I think within our space, you know, I we're leveraging the 3D for what everything that we do, right? But contractually, we're still held to the 2D. You know, so it's an interesting kind of gray space where you get these, you know, 2D documents, and that's what you're contractually held to. Uh, the 3D space is what we build to, you know, so it's it's interesting, right? It just makes no sense. So I, I think that a short answer to your question is that I think it needs to start early where I think contracts and I think trust needs to be, um, I think, supported within the, the 3D content that we're provided. And then that's what we maintain and build on throughout the life cycle of the project. And that's what the owners take at the end of the day. Right. Because, again, to your point, it, you know, it, it's sometimes it, well, today it starts in 3D, gets flattened to 2D for contracts. The GC resurrects it in 3D and coordinates everything in 3D. And at the end of the day, we flatten everything again and give it in 2D. Right. So think about those inefficiencies and really data loss at that point. You know, so it's no one's fault, but I think the industry has to get together and kind of figure out. And that's the how we start. But because, again, if we're starting the way we are today. I don't think we're ever going to get there as far as the efficiency gains that we need. Yeah, it's Hopefully funny that to say that, Ty. I was, I was at, a, at a large architecture firm and the CEO yeah. was telling me, I have this millennial working for me and they just sent the BIM to the structural engineer. They didn't get them to sign a, um, a, a waiver thing or any of that. They just like shared it with them. And, and these millennials are just too collaborative. Like they just <laughs> trust everyone and they're just way too open about everything. And I was like, I hear you, but maybe that's a good thing. Like, maybe it's not like, you know, I think we grew up in the generation of combativeness, right? Like, oh, it, you know, I've got to issue an RFI, like, or I just zoom and say, hey, what did you mean right here in this section? Like, what are you doing here? Like, what I need help here versus <laughs> like, oh, let me issue an RFI and let me track and CYA and, you know, I'm building a file against you for a change order. Like, I think we might have a generation coming through that's less interested in that. And just actually just wants to get their job done and like, hey, here's here's the model. Tell me what's wrong here. No, KP, you're absolutely right. Because, you know, they're asking why. <laughs> why am I doing this, right? I think for a lot of us, because we've been in this kind of, you know, I think, um, you know, in this process for so long, we just, we just kind of shrug our shoulders and move forward with it. But I think there's uh, something refreshing about that is, you know, asking the why. And, you know, I, that's something that, you know, it, t it touches on. Um, we have a summit every year for Hensel Phelps and I, I bring all the VDC resources in one location and we talk about these things. And the big challenge for us is really challenging everything that we do and asking the why. You know, there's everything that we've done, I think has been kind of centric on kind of old means and methods for a long time. I think with these innovations that we bring in, you also need to challenge really the processes and 
truly understand the process is really set up to succeed in this this environment where we're bringing in these technologies to improve the, you know to for improvement or is it still kind of centric on excel spreadsheets and you know printed sheets right it's just that, that philosophy needs to be challenged so that's a great point Kate. so we are well you know and i i think that part of the mechanism is is that there there are going to be trust sort of digital trust right that that's kind of coming that's that's once we get past this an unbelievable hype cycle of the metaverse and NFTs and all that nonsense that actually the, the true value of what actually blockchain can can bring and these trust mechanisms will start to to take that out of the conversation. And I also think that it's going to allow for you know smart contracts. I, I think I think triggering payments is going to be <laughs> probably one of the big drivers because if you you know tie a payment to completion of a, of a particular moment in time on a smart contract, verifiable through the 3D assets and, and maybe a LIDAR scan that gets matched up, all of that can actually be automated. But if you say that to people, they look at you like you're from outer space. <laughs> but, but I'm gathering that these are some things that you're looking at, but how do you even have that conversation to someone who doesn't understand the underlying technologies? No, so KP, you want to start there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's the problem sometimes, right? Our, our passion for the vision of technology gives us the inability to communicate to people. Like people don't care about the technology, right? The end customer does not care about block. I, I, I've, I've had so many companies. We have a couple investments, quote unquote, in blockchain. <clears throat> and I tell them never say blockchain ever again. <laughs> like never say it to a like, don't show up to a contractor and talk about blockchain. <clears throat> One, they're not that interested in that. But talk about like, do you want to get paid faster? Um, do you want better quality? I and mean, talk about all the benefits. And unfortunately, I think it does ourselves a disservice a lot of times, you know, around talking about the tech and not talking about like the, the benefits of it. And unfortunately, the people most passionate about tech want to talk about tech, right? They want to talk about um I, I mean, you can you can quiz a, a room full of people in our industry. They probably don't know the difference between blockchain and crypto. No. You say blockchain, they're like Bitcoin. I heard Bitcoin, it's a scam. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, so don't bring it up. You know, and I think there's work to be done. The good news is our industry. There's so many like segments where you can start applying the technology that you don't have to do it all at once. So. I agree. I think the why is important, right? I think, you know, I think within the construction space and KP spot on, I think when I hear blockchain and, and crypto, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm calling my friends and it's millennials, right? And they're like, you know, mining and I'm like, ah, what's this all about? But, you know, to your point, I think, you know, and even, you know, in the last decade of how I brought technology within Hensel Phelps and really, you know, the first time I brought, you know, the HoloLens and everyone's like, oh, what are you going to do? Watch movies with that, right? It's the why behind, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to validate and, and getting them comfortable with really the reason behind the technologies, right? It's everything that KP said there. It's for, for schedule. It's for budget. It's for, you know, safety. You know, all the, the key components of really what keeps this machine running in the field, right? And what's important, getting materials there on time, getting some middles reviewed faster, you know, making quick decisions when there's a change coming with the design. Those are the things that I think the, the why behind, you know, I think changing this environment for sure. Yeah, I think Roy started by saying, you know, when he first met with KP, he's like, I don't have a deck, I don't have any projections. I'm just going to show you the tech. And I think, and certainly with immersive technology, which is which is kind of where I live most of my day, um, it, you can't have a conversation with people unless they've actually seen what the technology can do. And it's like, unless you're sort of showcasing what it means to them on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's really hard for them to formulate an opinion. And I think you're right, KP, they don't care. <laughs> we're we're and I, Silicon Valley and we care, but no one else does. <laughs> and, and I think that the technology has to permeate their personal lives. It's been interesting. I had a vice chairman of a multi-billion dollar company. Four years ago, I sent him a Zoom link. He literally called me up and cursed at me. He's like, why can't you send a damn conference bridge like everyone else does? What is this Zoom thing? Like, you're killing me here. Like, just follow, like, this, use AT&T teleconferencing. What's wrong with you, right? And I'm like, okay. And so I did that. <clears throat> um, last year, he's like, hey, let's do a Zoom. 
I'm like, what just happened? Right. What just happened? And he's like, oh no, that, that's what I do now. Like I talk to my grandkids via Zoom and I use Zoom for this. And Zoom. I'm like, what happened to you? And the reality was in his work life, it wasn't important enough. He was used to, but in his personal life, and now per, it permeated his personal life. Right. So if, if you start playing with Oculus in your personal life and the same person is like meditating, using it or whatever, they start to pattern out like, oh, here's how I could use it at work. And, you know, right now, Zoom exists on just about every machine on the planet. <laughs> you know, because you have children on it and you have old people on it. And the old people are because they're talking to their grandkids, right? So I think some of this technology um, has permeated our personal lives well enough that now we start to question, um, like in our work life, do I need to go to the job site to inspect something or can the superintendent FaceTime me and show me what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think you're right. I think, it, and it's, it, it, and we always also talk about the killer app. It's really not the killer app. It's really a killer utility. It's like, how am I, how am I going to use this? Why? And, and when does it become seamless for me to do so? Like, I don't know if, you know, I remember having to have a, a work phone and a, and my personal phone until smartphones came out. And then it was like, we, you know, we became so proficient at, at this app culture that then it was really easy. And then, and then security protocols improved. So of course that big brother could like lock down portions of our phones. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, th I feel like that's sort of the, the same path that it's going to take, especially with immersive technology, with the wearables starting to hit the market. Cause I think the wearables are going to have a, a tremendous impact and efficiency on, on, you know, every aspect of, you know, the, the life cycle. Um, but it's going to, it's going to be, you know, to KP's point, like when we're using it to get directions or, you know, to see some cool artwork on the side of a building in Manhattan, when we go to visit, like, you know, it's going to take that utility for us to draw the line. Mm -hmm. And I think that your point on wearables, I don't want to wear, like, I don't want you knowing, right. Like I will <laughs> not share my location with people. That is just not culturally how I think my kids, they share their location with their buddy. I'm like, you want people to know where you are They're like, that it's more efficient. Yeah. It's more efficient for me to be transparent. I'm like, nobody gets to know where I am. Like that's just <laughs> how that is. Right. And so <laughs> you think about the culture of wearables. If you're going to put wearables on a job site, Ty, like what's that person thinking? Oh, right. Oh, you're tracking me. No, absolutely. And we've had some pilots already where that exact thing was really front facing where, you know, you want me to wear another device. You want me to wear another watch. You want me to charge something now? You want, you, no, you're not putting anything on my phone, right? So yes, it's very guarded, right? And so it's, you know, the value is there in terms of, you know, the safety side of things. And if there's a uh, emergency on site, we can track exactly who's on site and who's still on site when we do our evacuation. So there's value in that understanding, like when someone's climbing up the tower crane, what is their heart rate saying? that day, you know, are they not feeling where they should be? So we can kind of mitigate that, you know, potential risk. So there's value there, but to everything KP says is culturally having to get through that whole tracking into your personal space, you know, yeah. and having those, you know, that criteria or that service level agreement that says, no, you leave that device at site on when you're, you know, leave the site and then, you know, we won't track you off site. Right. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, Potential they, don't, they don't believe that you're not going to track. I know, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> it's a funny story. Cause like I travel a lot and um, very, you know, I think as fast as we move between my wife and I, um, she really knows where I am before I tell her. <laughs> so I'm in Chicago. She goes, I thought you were in LA, but I checked the app and you're in Chicago. So it's, it's pretty funny that way. And you know, KP's point of what is uh, sun resonated for me is just more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I share my location just with my kids and my, it's funny. My son said, you know, oh, I was looking to see where my brother was. And he goes, and I looked up and he goes, and, and your little bubble was right on top of mine. And we were literally side by side <laughs> on the 405 freeway in Los Angeles. And he rocked up next to me and he's like, waving i'm like just focus on the road please yeah. you're going 85 miles an hour <laughs> <laughs> but i'm definitely at, at kp's camp i i don't want people to know where i am exactly but i find yeah, myself yeah. i find myself gonna, going that way so. i'm not gonna share my fitness rings with you i don't need any other pressure about getting my <laughs> oh uh, yeah that yeah, yeah. <laughs> peloton your peloton yeah, funds I don't need, I don't like, wow you really it. phoned that one in yeah, yeah. well but it's all coming this sort of transparent living we'll see it, we'll see how it, it goes. is how it evolves 
So, so Ty, I, at the end of every show, um, we ask our guests the same question and it's about the future and it's about your, your future personally. So we've been talking a little bit about uh, technology and our own personal use of it, but if you could project yourself 20, 25 years in the future and you could have, you know, any technology, whether it's a gadget or just a service that, that makes, you know, you personally just makes your life better, makes you happy. And it doesn't have to be based in reality. You know, what would it be and what would it do? <laughs> you know, it's a great question. I get asked that often. You know, I think for me and I don't know if it's anything specific, but I think in my life and the things that I look at as far as technologies in my, you know, my own personal life, it's technologies that just takes away the redundancy of my day to day. I mean, if I have never have to open up another car door when I walk up on it, that's something that I would love, right? Uh, in my life today, like, you know, my wife loves turning on all the lights and I'm okay with that. But at night, and I got to turn all those lights off, having technologies that automatically at 11 p.m. all the lights go off, right? Uh, I mean, things like that is amazing to me. You know, things that, you know, I think that I do in my day to day that I don't care less to do ever again. As technologies yeah. get better, those are the types of things that I'm always looking for and, and sourcing. So I love that. Well, you can have the light thing that can happen today. Like, and so you shall. <laughs> well, here's a funny story to that. I had my whole house programmed that way. And then, you know, sometimes when the uh, connectivity cuts out, everything resets. And we had a blackout one time and at 2 a.m. all the electric electricity cut out and it came back at 3 a.m. And every single light in the house came up and woke oh, no. everybody up. <laughs> So there's always, you know, there's, there's yeah, pros that. that. We haven't quite cracked that. Yeah. 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 So. yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think let's just, let's like limit the things that, you know, there are these rote activities that we have to do every day so we can get back to the, you know, high level, okay. the important stuff. That's right. That's right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This, this was such a fantastic episode and, you know, we really appreciate you joining us and, and sharing all your wisdom. Yo, Amy, thank you for having me. KP, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Good to see you. Yeah.